Uh, a bit about me. Um, my, my early life was as a charge nurse. Um, wasn't necessarily going to be always the way. I was going to be an engineer, but I ended up being a charge nurse. I spent five years in resus. It's the right reason I moved to Coventry. I'm right next to Walsgrave Hospital here. I haven't moved since then. And I spent 15 years uh, doing palliative nursing and a few years ago. Always been a naturalist, so a lifelong naturalist. I was born really from uh, my early years, spent living in Malawi, Central Africa. My dad worked for the UN and uh, outside of a Saturday morning matinee, it was very old school over there, um, we had not much to do other than uh, the natural history around us and there was plenty of that. So um, formative years, it pretty much stuck. So I'm very much a naturalist that has come to filmmaking. My dad was into photography in a massive way and whilst we were over in Central Africa, uh, there wasn't any processing units, so you had to have a dark room, so I would enter into the dark room often with him. And it was the stereotypical affair with the strings and the pegs and all the, all the chemical trays and, and whatnot. Um, so, but like all kids looking to, to, to their fathers, I guess I wanted to do the same, but a little bit different, so I, I kind of came into film. And as a hobby, um, throughout sort of the 80s and 90s, I would um, edit places I'd be in as a naturalist. So these are very much wildlife based holidays. Uh, I would edit VHS to VHS and uh, make uh, kind of productions which I will then share to my friends, I'm sure they love them. Um, but from my nursing days, we born an idea, especially out in the community and doing palliative care, um, of bringing um, these films or having a company that made wildlife films and bringing them out into a sort of domiciliary environment, into the community. I saw so many people that were institutional, so many people that loved nature and were in a position right now that wasn't going to change. Um, where they wouldn't be able to access it anymore. Um, so the idea was to construct, produce films, show them in a huge way, so a big two meter, two meter wide screen, a roll up screen with the surround sound, um, everything uh, but the um, breeze on their face. Um, started that in 2014. Um, it took off like a whirlwind that was helped by an appearance on Springwatch in 2015. And then I started doing commissions, I think, for Warwickshire Wildlife Trust about 2017 they start to notice my work and um, that's been going on ever since but the core of the business is still very much going out into the community of course that's been a, uh, a, 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 a sore affair this year because everything I do is in the social environment and there's been um, none of that at all so but I will pull through the company's going to pull through as long as, as long as we get to Easter uh, the bookings are already there so I'm looking forward to getting, getting back out into these residential and care environments and showing, showing these films again um, just to say, this isn't going to be a, a webinar necessarily about the technicalities of, of camera work. There's no f-stops here. There's no nothing about exposure or apertures. This is more about a mindset um, because really you can have any kind of equipment, um, very expensive iron equipment um, or just a smartphone, but if you're not in the right mindset, you know, you're going to come away with um, So that's the, the first thing to kind of stress. So I'll start the film and... Um, it's right on topic. Which camera? So I'm just going to pause it there. I'm going to ask, ask you, um, are there uh, people who have DSLRs out there? Do people possess high-end cameras or is it, is it smartphones or, or get to un unmute your mics and, and tell me what you've got? <laughs> Anybody? One at a time. <laughs> No? Is, is it all smartphones for everybody? Or, or just some people have got DSLRs as well? I've got okay. a DSLR, but I haven't used it in about five years. So it's sort of in a okay. drawer. So I probably right. couldn't use it now, I don't think, at all. I like could point and shoot, that'd be it. Okay. M might it see the light of day again then, possibly? Possibly, yeah. It was something that I did when I was sort of a um, sixth form student, but as I've kind of gone into world of work and stuff, just dropped off as a hobby, right. Does it have film, you know? Sorry? Does it have the ability to capture film? Uh, yeah, I think it does. It would do, yeah. Excellent. Well, that's, that's, that's good news. Well, the answer to which camera, um, I know it's a bit cliche, is simply... Go on, you I know it's very cliche, but it is, it is so true. Um, really there's one thing that's more important than anything here and that's story. Um, there's, there's an old adage in, in, uh, in this industry that story is key and it really doesn't matter in what format you, you push that story through. If you've got a story to show, 
um, it becomes a real success. Um, just to go through some of my cameras, I'd love to expand my screen, but I haven't got that yet. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and come back to me. Is that right, Debbie? Just so I can show. Okay. So will it come to me now as a main screen? Am I on the main screen now, am I? Yeah, you're all good. Okay, great. So, um, talking about cameras and different types of cameras, um, I know um, with your tech talk, uh, you saw lots of, of these, which is uh, trail cams. It's something I use a lot of, and footage of which you'll see um, used by these tonight. This is the Bushnell HD version. If you've never seen inside of one, um, it has a full rack of uh, 12 batteries there. Um, but they tell you you shouldn't be using rechargeable batteries. I don't as of yet, although I'd save a lot of money if I did, I expect. Uh, SD card goes in the bottom there, and uh, you've got the menu controls here uh, to, to set up. It's, it's, a, it's a nice trail cam, it's, it's done me well. As I say, you'll see footage uh, from this um, sometime this evening. My mainstay cam, and this is why I, I say that um, these things are subjective about the cameras you own. This is my mainstay camera. Uh, it's a bridge camera. It's not a DSLR. And this is why I get most of my wildlife clips on. Um, it's a 4K um, producing camera. It's a three quarter inch sensor, um, but it, it films in 4K at an incredible 60 times optical zoom. Um, and of course, for me, that's absolutely crucial. This comes in now at about 250 pounds all in. Um, if I don't mention the make, of this camera to anybody. Um, they assume that I've got a high-end DSLR with you know um, lenses costing many, many thousands of pounds. So it just goes to show it is very, very subjective. This is one to remember. If you can get this camera, it's fantastic. It's the Panasonic FZ82. So that's the mainstay of my long shots, the wildlife footage on this bridge camera. I have a GH5, uh, which is filming me right now, so I can't show you that. Um, but that's what I do my B-roll on. If you don't know what that term is, I'll explain that uh, a little bit later on. Um, I also have um, an action cam. Well, I did have an action cam uh, up until a few weeks ago, months ago, when I was filming the Commission for Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. And as you can see that, but it's it's been driven over by an Arctic truck that was on the Coventry Ring Road. Um, but the film that I made with this, where this particular incident happened, I got runner-up in the national storytelling competition uh, run by the wildlife trust and the guardian newspaper so it was kind of worth it but i need to invest in, in an action cam um, so that's kind of the mainstay of, of the cameras i use predominantly the gh5 which is filming me right now and that bridge camera the fz82 but just to prove a point to you i'll start the film again And you're going to see now some shots of this wonderful fox. And that's the opening sequence to my allotment fox film, which has proven very successful, followed by these are two sequences, two sequences from the film itself. That's Spot the Dog Fox, you know, the dominant male. And then just coming up now, we're going to see his sub adult daughter. That's Smudge. Um, Really, really good footage, amazing stuff. Always gets a gasp from audiences. Really comes up well on a two meter wide screen. Uh, really impressive, some of my favorite shots. And all of that from this camera. I'll just pause that there. And this was the actual camera. So this was bought when Wild started in 2014. As you can see, it's not even 4K. It's a HD 1080p, it cost me 30 pounds when I bought it in 2014. It costs a mere 1650 now. And that, those shots were from this camera. So again, please don't think, you know, this, this is so subjective about the, this, this quality aspect. Um, a neat little trick though, if you, uh, if you are familiar with these action cameras, you may know that um, they don't hold much battery life. So how was I going to set up in that particular scene then? Well, I knew that Foxy was using the hedgerow, that run that's on, on an allotment. Um, I had baited the area a couple of days before, um, uh, at a regular time so they kind of knew that something might be there um, for them to appear so I kind of had a bracket of time where I assumed they might turn up because the food the base had gone on the previous days but then I had the problem about battery life um, 
And I don't know if you're aware, I'm sure most of you are, but you can get these things. These are long life battery cells. Um, this back in the day was a brand new thing. We're talking about 2014 when I made this film. Um, and um, if you know about action cams, then also you'll know that you can't, you can't um, plug in the long life battery uh, until it's got its case on. So uh, I needed also some, some, some protection against the elements. And I used this old Chinese um, takeaway tray. So the camera was in there and then I, I, I perforated a little hole in the bottom for the tripod, which is a bendy tripod. And it sat like that in the hedgerow, uh, attached the battery through a hole here. Uh, this was in a sandwich bag down in the undergrowth. So the whole affair was, was like this. Uh, it ran for about four hours. I came back and I assessed, assessed the files and I had those two wonderful clips amongst many. Um, so a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of thinking ahead and creating a storyline, a little bit of baiting a couple of days before, and, and it all came through. And I can tell you now that scene, those two scenes have been watched by uh, tens of thousands of people now uh, over the last six years. Um, so that's really just to press the point home about the, the types of camera you need. Your smartphone, especially now with the abilities of 4K footage, is just, it's just brilliant, it really works. Um, right, I think I've covered pretty much so, um, next big thing, um, if you're going to uh, approach uh, filmmaking or photography, and I'm thinking as well because I do know that you're ambassadors, and I, I'm guessing, am I right, that part of the remit was that you had to market, you're going to market conservation issues, um, this is part of the skill set you're, you need to learn over the next two years, isn't it, the ability to, to, to transcend what you're doing to to the wider audience um, yeah the idea is to sort of raise awareness about the conservation issues that people feel really passionate about um and often feel like they don't know how to get that across to other people so um, to teach about conservation first off and then to sure. to give people skills so that they feel more confident about sharing that with other people excellent um I, forgive me i forget the lady's name for the tech talk last time it's Dr. Hey. Hayley, that's it. Uh, I love the fact that the last part of the upload that I watched this, this morning uh, was you all saying that visuals were the thing, um, the high impact thing you felt in pushing this message across. Um, I thought, well, what a brilliant way to start this particular webinar because we're all, we're all about visuals and storytelling. And I think if you're going to push a message home, um, rather than kind of a rigid kind of starched affair, just pushing facts at people, if you can create stories around them, um, it's that people then care about it. They really start to, to it really starts to envelop them. Um, but um, the initial thing to master this art, because a lot of people see it as a dark art, wildlife filmmaking, um, is to find yourself a patch. I've said this to everybody. I've run courses through um, Brandon, and the initial thing I always say to people is find yourself a patch. Now that can be um, your back garden. It can be uh, the local park for me it was my local park and this is a uh, this is my local park appearing now it's Calvin Castle um, not far from from Wallsgrave I'm only about 200 yards from this park a lot of history me in this park um, and a lot of people then over lockdown um, just like me I think have either discovered patches or rediscovered their patch and I certainly rediscovered this particular patch over my lockdown um, so much so that I started making films. I had a lot of time in my hands, obviously, the bookings had gone. So, so I started to take films from my lockdown and I was using my yard. I have an asphalted yard, but you'd be pleased to know, Debbie, I get a head, lots of hedgehogs in my asphalted yard. I've got lots Great. of slugs. <laughs> lots and lots of slugs. So they're, they're in all the time. Uh, but yeah, this, this, this lockdown um, and this, this, this the situation that forced me to focus um, taught me um, lots of new skills. I was surprised and, and certainly opened my eyes again to, to Calvin Castle Park. That's my little boy there. And I was starting to think about storylines with the park and, and what could I do. Um, but obviously, as you know, this initial lockdown was an eight week period. So I knew that, and especially in a very kind of um, um, vibrant season as well, just approaching spring. So much so that we caught our first migrant, my first migrant of the year, this little chiff chaff was in the park um, that was an enormous moment so I, I made these these vlogs 
which actually went out to um, various different residential and, and care environments. But it forced me to attend the same area again and again and again um, to actually carry out uh, what I preach, and that is to return to a patch, uh, become familiar with it, to observe, to take everything in, to look at patterns, to notice the smaller things. Um, anybody know what this, this little guy is? I'll just pause it there. If you don't know, he's, these are just amazing. I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, 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 do we have arachnophobes? If we have arachnophobes, you needn't fear about this one. It's about five millimeters long. Right, the image makes it look, look much bigger than it is. This you is can always use my... the chat function, everyone, if you don't want to speak out. Uh, <laughs> this is one of our jumping spiders. Um, it's a zebra spider. I think there's about 10 different variants, subspecies um, of this spider. And I absolutely adore them. But these huge forward-facing eyes, um, they, they don't spin webs per se, <clears throat> but they use silk as an anchor. They'll always attach themselves before they jump on a prey item, just in case they, they lose their balance, at least they can be saved uh, by this safety line. These massive forward-facing eyes um, and these wonderful pouts, those are the two, two extensions there at the front. Um, and they will follow you. The great thing about these guys is they will fix on you. So if you come down close to them, and they fix their eyes onto you and you move your head backwards and forwards, they will follow you, they will look at you. Each and it's lovely. It's, uh, I'm, I can see I'm not endearing too many people <laughs> to this little guy. Uh, actually but it, got a um, spiders webinar booked for March. To, so okay. I, I'm loving your enthusiasm pre that event. Because <laughs> excited well, about if, spiders. <laughs> if you're falling over the spider, then this, this is the spider, I would say. It's the zebra spider. You will have this spider. Okay, so come the warmer climbs again, come April time, they like windowsills, um, inside and outside, although they prefer outside. Um, if you catch a sight of one, you've got to get your eye on initially, but once you've got your eye on, you'll, you'll see them everywhere. Um, and uh, watch them stalking prey. It's, it's fascinating, it really is, and then leap uh, and, and enjoy, their, enjoy their meal. Um, lovely little things. I, I really, I'd like a little plush toy of this little guy, I think. A bit, a bit of a softy that way. I do, I do like my zebra spiders. Yeah, so going out and finding your patch, much as I did again, um, it is crucial. And it really is just about observation, about testing your skills, um, thinking about storylines, looking for patterns, looking for routines. I also say, you know, if there's any societies or associations involved with your patch, um, I have two areas next to me. I have the park here, and then there's a friend's of Calden Castle Park, which I'm now involved with. Uh, but I also have Sal Valley just, just down the road here. Um, and also I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the Friends of the Sal Valley. They can offer lots of interesting information. But go at all times of the day. Um, and, uh, you know, the only thing that's, that, that's stopping you getting material like this isn't skill. It's just literally just leaving the house at the right time. Anybody can get stuff like this. They really can. I would say to you, if possible, to get some kind of... Um, um, how can I put it, stabilising equipment. Um, if you're using a smartphone, if you look online, you can get relatively cheaply now. Uh, the kind of gorilla pod affairs, have you seen those things? Um, they're sort of junctured on, on, on balls like this. Um, you can get brackets. This is holding um, my uh, digital recorder, audio recorder right now, which we'll come to later. But these, these little guys, you can get brackets that fit, that kind of the universal fit uh, for smartphones. Uh, that would be a godsend. Um, probably 10, 10 to 20 pounds for these things. Don't, you don't have to buy the Gorilla Pod, buy a generic one. Um, that'll work just as well. Um, you can start to get to get shots um, such as this. I didn't know there were green woodpecker um, in, in my park, uh, checking out holes. Again, a new, a new discovery. But it's lovely, lovely also, and I like this juxtaposition um, of seeing wildlife against an urban backdrop. Um, and as the weeks progressed, obviously the lime green period kicked in. Uh, did you remember that? How wonderful that was? <laughs> a bit of new life in, in a really miserable time, depressing time. But I started to include passers-by as well. I let people, you know, I was very obvious as a cameraman. Um, so they knew they were passing in front of a camera whilst I was recording. There wasn't really an issue there. But I wanted to show this juxtaposition of wildlife and people living side by side. Uh, and then, of course, we headed sort of further into spring. And we had all the blossom coming out of like, the uh, wild cherry here. And I would put an urban backdrop. Again, I was thinking about storylines. This is actually in a film, which is very much got a, got a very kind of um, 
urban storyline to it. Birds like this, I wasn't expecting. This is a linnet. This is central Coventry. This is a linnet, you know, which is a sort of moorland species. And then the dandelion clocks came out, the first of the dandelion clocks. And who came down? You know, it was almost predictable, of course, that the finches feeding on the first seeds of the year. Literally, these dandelion clocks are the first seeds of the year. Now, you know, once you get a patch, what you, what you must remember is this will happen now every year. You're watching cycles here that will be repeated. Um, you, you know, get a notepad, note things down about when the dandelion clocks appear, because then you'll know that for next year you can prepare yourself. Ah, so in a couple of weeks' time or within the next two weeks, there's going to be finches over in the park and they're going to be feeding on the dandelion clocks. Um, this is what a patch does for you. Um, but the key thing really I want you to do is to be in a place where you're not moving too much. Um, the, key, the key thing here is passiveness and that's, that's going to be the next, the next subject we, we come to. Um, so any of you had your hands forced? Did you all go out and discover green spaces again during the lockdown? Early in the year? Nods will do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, was, I did. It was, a, it was our only salvation, wasn't it, I think? It was our only salvation. And look at that. I mean, if there is an urban bird with more finery than this guy. So I had to get up early for this, bearing in mind this is now going to be into May. And as you can see, the sun is hitting this darling uh, horizontally. So uh, th this might look uh, like sort of half past nine, ten o'clock. This is most probably about five o'clock in the morning uh, when I got this. <laughs> you know, this is very early on. Uh, but if you're going to catch this bird in its finery, we have a bird in our gardens that's got the colours of the rainbow on it. You know, who would have thought? Who would have thunk it? Amazing bird. And, uh, and all at 5 a.m. If you get up and get out, you'll see these things and you'll be able to record them. That's actually a male, by the way. Just stop it there. Do you know how I know that's a male? And if you know, the one way the sex starlings to the base of the bill here. So that grey area tells me that's a male. So females have a solid, solid yellow all the way down, whereas males have this lovely grey patch here. So find yourself a patch, um, and then you'll see these stories play out. And, and then remember also, with consistency, these stories will continue to play out. Patches also let you look at things in a different way, especially if you're being passive. Um, a dandelion, who'd have known you have these little stamens, these beautiful little stamens. You know, have you ever looked this close at a dandelion? Incredible patterns. And this is my, my yard here. I didn't even know these existed. This flowering purple shamrock in my asphalted yard. You know, things of things beauty. I never would have seen or noticed these things. Certainly wouldn't have filmed them if it hadn't been for the lockdown. Um, right, so I'm going to show you a film now that's about passiveness. So this was um, a vlog that I did, so there'll be audio on this and you'll hear me narrating. Um, and it was about being passive and about observing and about how, how that will take you to places that, that you just wouldn't go to if you didn't stop, basically. So um, I'll leave you for a second, just to enjoy it. And I would suggest sit near its base and give it 10 minutes or so. That way you'll realise that the rhythms of life around you are holding sequences and patterns. Possibly maybe a favourite perch. And a favourite perch at this time of the year can generally only mean one thing. You're near a nest site. It might not just be a favourite perch, it might be a sequence of flying patterns. A familiar bird or a similar bird passing by you every few minutes. With your curiosity pricked and a small exploration and a bit more passiveness, you might notice there's a tree hole. Another few minutes, all of its secrets should be revealed. It's then that you'll start to realise that these kinds of observations can have a chain effect, like a domino fall. Because as you're watching this tree hole, you notice that down in the brambles at its base sits a quiet female chiff chaff. 
She too knows you're there, but she doesn't see you as a threat. Not anymore. You're not moving, you're passive, you're part of the natural furniture. He notices that she's scanning towards an old stump, an old mature tree. On one of its spurs, you'll find her mate. Preening after a hard dose of the dawn chorus. And just then, out of the corner of your eye, you'll notice that on the trunk of this old tree, there's more movement of a curious sort. A small brown bird disappears behind the bark. It's a tree creeper. And again, with another few moments, you'll see it's another nest under construction. Yeah, um, yeah. with absolute sincerity. Now I'm going to tell you um, it, it, within the next hour about how a lot of this storytelling is, is smoke and mirrors. You know, as long as there's a bit of authenticity to it, then why not? Because this is how you get a message across. But I can tell you with absolute sincerity, that is exactly what happened in that sequence, in that chronological order. Um, I arrived, I was passive. I saw what turned out to be that great tip uh, flying past me constantly and, and ending up on this on this one branch. So I knew there must be a nest there. It wasn't just him, actually. I saw quite a, other, quite a few other birds heading to scrub, one of which was a black cap, and you'll see that coming up. Um, but just by stopping. Now, if, if you um walk through areas uh, of nature you will see nothing um i there's an adage i, I have i never ask a rambler or a walker if they've seen something <laughs> if i'm if i'm in a certain habitat say i want to see a hare i never i never stop people that, that sort of stride through because they, they never do a bit like moses in the sea of galilee they part the waves nature moves away from a moving object um people often think they see more in hides because they're in hides but I would say that probably most of the wildlife out there that you see from a hive knows you're there. Um, but you've stopped. You're passive. Uh, you're in a position where, where you're not a threat. And it's been proven that hive's been there for a long time. You aren't a threat. Um, so there isn't any real reason either to get sort of camouflaged up. A lot of people think you've got to be dressed head to toe in, in car keys. And, and, and really, you don't. What you do literally is you have to stop. OK, it might be favourable if you dress down a little bit and don't have the primary colours on. Um, but I'll tell you, my, my biggest and best piece of equipment, dirty old cushion, always in the boot of my car. Um, I, I'd carry this along, i stick it at the base of a tree, and within 10 minutes, things start to happen around me. Um, it really sounds really cliche, doesn't it? And I, when I'm saying it, I can hear myself. It sounds, um, you know, this it, almost, almost sounds spiritual, but it's not. It, it's just a simple fact that the wildlife will approach you I and mean, it's curious a lot of it will approach you and will return to its normal routine should you prove not to be a threat but you have to stop and you have to give it that, that initial 10 to 15 minutes um, and then things really start to happen all of my shots i've never ever got any of my shots in the hoof uh, it's never been a case of oh look at that stop and take uh, the picture it's always come from relenting it's something my little 10 year old boy finds hard to understand trying because he just wants me to move and constantly go places. In fact, I often just send him away so he can play somewhere else, sort of 100 yards away, whilst, whilst I'll sit down. Uh, but, you know, and, it's, and it tends to be always those, those 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, and things start to happen. You see the faces appear, you see the pattern starting, the routines. Um, and and, and that, that's when then I start the story building. I start to think, okay, so what's, you know, you've got to ask questions. Why? Everything you see is doing something for a purpose. It's another thing that they, people forget about nature. They always think that they're doing random things. They're not. They're doing everything for a purpose. They're not wasting energy for no reason. Um, so there's always a there's always a story behind what you're watching, um, and that, that's a good thing to think of as well. But this and getting your bottom on it and relenting, being passive, is the absolute key. Um, the course that I run at Brandon Marsh. I say this right from the off. It's the first thing I say in the first five minutes. And I say, I could literally leave now. And that's the other thing you need to know is stop. Because people just don't realise that. And they feel awkward, I think, doing that as well. Um, I think they fear that people passing them and wondering why they're just not moving, just stood there or sat there. Um, but, you know, they literally are not going to see what you're going to see. And eventually you'll have people passing you as you're filming something or, or watching something and they'll be wanting to know what you're seeing because they'll be jealous they'll be envious that you're seeing something that they can't 
and that's because you've been passive. Right. Um, I think the next the next one is tracks and signs, uh, which I, I, I said to uh, Debbie, I'll, I'll stop that image there. Um, I said to Debbie, I'm not really going to go too much on uh, or into this. I know you've encroached into nuts, uh, your small mammals webinar, um, and the uh, the dormouse uh, nuts and the wood mouse nuts. And I remember uh, that wood, wood mice have nuts in hordes. Is that right, Debbie? Yes, uh, nice, nice memory, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, on a mouse, you see a nice little circular motion um, on, on the rim, and, uh, and the wood mouse also has a, has a rough edge, I think, anyway. Yeah, but, yeah, keep going. <laughs> I, I didn't, I really enjoyed it, I really, really did. I was half past two this morning. Um, four tracks and signs, um, for the great majority of tracks and signs, obviously, two hour webinar about filmmaking, I, I really can't. Uh, uh, go into to them too much, but they are they are valuable. Certainly, reading reading the land, of course, is is valuable. Um, for my birds and for feathers, I would suggest there's the Helm book on tracks and signs uh, for birds. It has pretty much every feather you could ever imagine. Beautiful, beautiful books and pellets. Lots of pellets in this. I don't know if you've got that, Debbie, but that's worth it, especially for pellets. Um, um, yeah, great book. And for all of the stuff, uh, the Nick Baker RSPB Tracker Guide. Um, is also a great book um, by a great guy. I love his, I love his writing style. Uh, really nice chap, Nick. Um, so those two I would suggest to you. But above and beyond that, the one thing uh, that I, I, I think that people, um, either they know about it or they don't, is what you're seeing now on the screen. To, um, these are desire paths. So um, I'm hoping that some of you have noticed these. Um, a desire path is a traditional path used by wildlife. Actually, uh, the official definition of a desire path is something used by anybody as, as the most convenient route from A to B. Uh, desire paths are, are, are come as a huge annoyance to like, people like city councils that put up these wonderful asphalt paths through parks. Yeah, everybody does the diagonal across the crossroads if you catch me up the quickest route and they create their own path, the desire path. But of course, wildlife has these desire paths as well. Some are pretty obvious, um, like the one you just saw uh, previously. That's, um, uh, probably deer, I, I would think maybe more of it, maybe badger um, crossing that meadow there. Uh, but then also you have the likes of something a bit more subtle, which is cutting through the hedgerow. Um, you can see the grass is there and the, and the scrub is parted. Um, and then a smaller version of that, I guess. Uh, I'm sure you've seen these. Now these are worth noting, um, especially if you're in the position of putting out, I'll just pause that, uh, trail cams because you know that, that something is there and it might be a good fun thing to do anyway. You can surmise what it might be and then secrete a trail cam and come back and see if you're right. You know, you might be in for, for a great surprise. Um, so it's definitely something something to note. Um, if, you, if you believe you're in a certain area that might be devoid of wildlife or you're wondering if there is kind of, sort of large mammal, I don't know, I know we don't have too many large mammals here in Britain, sadly, um, but do look out for these for these desire paths. So that's the one tracks and signs I will uh, I will I will give to you. I'm, I love desire paths. Once you get your eye in, you'll you'll see them everywhere, including the human ones. Just to show you that desire paths work, I've got a little film coming up. Uh, my word, this is an old film, it's 2012. This film so old, this was done on tape. Um, but this was me in Pembrokeshire. I got to a rise just outside of St. David's and I saw this fixin. and she's left her, her earth, which is just here in the background. She finds the desire path and then just to prove the point, um, she, she neatly takes the whole desire path. Um, I'm guessing that, I mean, there were sheep in, in this field, so I'm guessing that sheep often used. Well, um, talking about, um, I'll just do a preempt to this next one. I'm talking about, um, kind of relenting and and my mum used to say uh, sharp sharp eyes sharp ears uh, which sounds like it might be a bit of an effort but it's not because when you do relent and get passive you start to then you know really sink to a new level of sensory experience in your in the place you're in in this natural world you're in you, it lifts no end every minute that passes it gets higher and higher and higher as you notice these things around you and here's one good example you know it, it's hard to catch these things on film um but this was back in 2016, I think, uh, and I went with a friend of mine who, who'd heard there was a golden eagle eerie uh, down in this particular sort of valley 
you think it'd be called a glen, but it's called Strathdonham Valley in the Highlands. And we knew the rock face, but potentially this, this eagle, this pair of eagles were, was on, there was supposed to be an eerie there. Um, and we only had one afternoon, we drove up from the Midlands to then drive back down. Uh, but both of us are desperate to see, to see a golden eagle. So just watch this now and, and see how it plays out. Basically, we've just arrived in the van and we're scanning and scanning and hoping that we can see uh, the skull. Can you hear sound, yes? Can you hear yeah, sound, Debbie? We can hear everything, yeah. Okay. So if we'd arrive, we hoped the weather would stay fair. We only had the one afternoon. Um, obviously, you know, the, the weather turns into sixpence, anybody that's been in the Highlands will notice. That, that was the rock face. Um, but sadly, the clouds <laughs> started to move in. Um, I think we probably had about three hours left before we had to hit the road again. We've been there by now, probably about three hours. Um, and then it started to absolutely pour down. So the omens were against us and we thought that uh, pretty much it was going to be uh, a, a no show. But then something happened. That's something miraculous. Well, actually, if you're if you're a naturalist, or if you're just having a bit of, I mean, you can imagine our perception then was was like real high because we've been there for so many hours. But we saw this aberration, and this happened a few times, come across the side of of this hill here, and it was calling. And it was a female kestrel, and she was really, really annoyed. Um, this is the breeding season, but she's being territorial, no doubt about it. She was making a hell of a noise. She was cutting through the rain. So we watched her avidly um, and she flew and she flew and she flew and she got to a certain point. She flicked out her talons just there and then she went up. We thought, mm. whatever, whatever's annoying her is just there. Now this is through the rain, this is about half a mile away. Uh, and we're not here necessarily to film, you know, any kind of high definition, just to see the eagle. We thought, what is that aberration? Could that be the eagle? Has that kestrel? Just giving us all the clues we needed through using our senses and realizing what's going on or asking the question what is going on here so we gave it another 20 minutes another half an hour don't worry if you've lost the spot another circle's about to pop up to show you where you know this aberration was I mean, to all intents and purposes right now through this rain it just looks like a rock wait for the green circle there it is this is where the kestrel lifted and just about to give up and then this happened And that aberration turned out to be a female golden eagle. She cut down through the rain, a big two metre wide wingspan. And then she entered the sky above us as if she was looking at us. We were the only two people there, uh, scanning to see who we were, what we were about. And these beautiful, massive wings of hers. Now our passiveness was enforced there, obviously it was because we weren't going to go anywhere else apart from that rock face. Um, but, you know, relenting, taking our senses to a new level because we were there to try and find these eagles. And then I think probably on the fourth or fifth time that that happened with that kestrel, we thought, hang on, we should be questioning this. What is she up to? But there was a peregrine flying around as well that was annoyed. But this kestrel, we seen our kestrel, really feisty and making very definite movements and, and repeating them. So we thought, no, we must take notice of this. What is she doing? And she led us right to that female golden eagle. We would have left, we wouldn't have seen her if it wasn't fun. It wasn't for her if we're realizing uh, what was going on there. So, sure. Uh, just quickly, um, I'm lucky enough to have a childhood friend who, who, who works with Roy Dennis. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Tim McCrill and Roy Dennis that do the um, translocation of um, the white-tailed eagle to the Isle of Wight. Um, um, which I'm hoping to film um, when sort of lockdown ends um, for the third season this coming year. But Ian and I went to the base of the Golden Eagle's Nest and I, I picked up that. Um, that's a wonderful, I mean, I knew the nest was there, but if you were to walk along and find this, this is the second primary of the female Golden Eagle. Um, and it's mass, that's just the primary. So if you can imagine, that's just the fingers at the end of the wing. Uh, and this itself is, is a good two foot. Long, and that's just one one primary feather and the wonderful resistance to it you know when they fly and you can see these fingers sort of turned up as they as they, as they move around um so yeah 
That's uh, one of my best <laughs> uh, tracks and signs finds is that a female second primary from a female golden eagle. Okay, um, <clears throat> next film again comes from a passive moment. This is much more recent. This is this year and much more local. This is down at Marston Junction. Um, you know Marston Junction. Yeah, um, just pause it there and it's to, to do with this bird. Any of you know Marston Junction? Nod, nod heads, shake heads. Yeah. Um, obviously, oh, Jake. Hey. Sorry. Just seen Jake. Hi there. Hi, Simon. Um, hey. Hi. Right, nice to see you. Um, you're in the 50th film, do you know? All right. Well, watch the 50th film. You're, you're on it. Check it out. Yeah, sure. So, I went down to Marston Junction, as you'll see in a later clip, to film a certain mammal, which I'm definitely sure we'll know what that mammal is, um, because it's one of the hotspots for them, uh, or at least attempt to film them. But whilst I was there wreckying uh, and being passive, so I sat in one spot, and I, I absolutely sincere about this, I sat in one spot for three afternoons, um, because that's really the way to do it. But I, I, rec I, I realised that at a certain time of day, just after midday, between half past twelve and one, uh, there was a squadron of SIFs. And actually, there's a very amount of run lines for the swallows as well, coming down to take water from the top of the canal. Um, I, I knew then by the second day, I'd, I'd seen this repeat, I remembered it from the first day, and I thought, no, hang on, um, I'm back tomorrow, I can make the most of this. Um, so I brought my GH5 and I filmed in 120 frames a second. Now, um, if I just tell you that the cinematic standard is 24 frames a second, so if you're filming in 120 frames a second, you can get X amount of seconds, four seconds, five seconds for, for every um, sort of second watch. So a fast moving bird like a swift deserves that kind of, uh, of attention. So that was the idea. Could I, um, and obviously I only knew this, remembering again because I've been passive and in one spot for X amount of days, could I catch one of these swifts? coming in and skimming the water and actually taking the water. So this, this, these were the results, this is what happened. The ones I was waiting for, a squadron of swifts. You can hear the sound, yes? One. So these are three, two. three of them coming in, one, two, and three, and they were breaking like the dam busters, so they didn't collide with the bridge the there. Dam busters. Coming, coming right up. Um, but the next shot was, was, was the great shot. Um, Quite a challenge to try and maintain this one swept around right frame in these guys this is and you can see he opens his mouth flash. just now there we are We're really happy with this shot and then takes a super oh, pleased with that no way i mean if you you can imagine there's no way on this earth i could ever have got that shot just by passing there isn't there simply isn't a way that you know just by walking down the canal and Oh, there's a swift, grab the camera and off we go. You just, it's just not possible. Passiveness is everything. It really is, guys. Um, if, I'm, if I'm the root cause of you putting on pounds and stones here, <laughs> by sitting around a lot and eating snacks, as I certainly have, um, I'm, I'm up, I apologise. But if you really want to get some quality wildlife footage, it is about being passive. It's about noticing patterns um, and then taking it from there. You know, um, exactly what happened there. So. I think we've gone over passiveness enough and using your senses, honing your senses and getting to that new level by being passive, uh, by appreciating these rhythms of life and, and then I mean, constructing stories as well by questioning what's going on. Um, next thing we're doing is lures. This is quite a, a, quite a hefty section because I was thinking if there's anything that's going to get wildlife closer to you, especially if you haven't got a large telephoto lens, it's going to be the likes of lures. Now this sounds quite complex. A lure is a garden table, Let, let's face facts here. Um, a lure is putting out seeds or, you know, for, for anything. A peanuts for badgers. These, these are all types of lures. This then, bearing in mind, puts you in a position where potentially, should you get into a sequence of putting out lures and get successful results, you know, you know that you're getting a good response of leaving, say, if you've got a smartphone and you've got one of these nifty little kind of uh, generic gorilla pods and got your phone on a bracket, leaving your phone in a certain place, walking away, retract, retreating, walking away from that whilst it's recording and letting the wildlife come to the lure and getting those wonderful close-up shots. Um, I've done it, uh, the equivalent of it, as you've seen um, already with an action cam. You can do this also using lures um, and, and with a phone. Um, so lures aren't also they're just food, although we're going to start off with that, if I believe. So there's a, a selection of films about lures. Uh, the first 
try and guess uh, <laughs> the lure I'm making here. So this, this is part of my storyline, this is a vlog. Um, the story started with the DeWalt and I'm finding a nice piece of natural wood, getting a hole through it. Apple in the background is a clue. Uh, no one's getting any ideas about where this might be leading. But I guess this would be a good idea for a conservation story, you know, if you want to show that, that you've got these, whatever they are, <laughs> these mammals, um, this could be the way that you, you start the, the story. And this would be interesting if you were watching this an audience immediately you're intrigued. This is a nifty little lens now that you can fit onto trail cameras that give you close focus. That one of the big problems with trail cameras was that it, um, they focus on the right. But um, such personal any ideas internet. about what that might be? Anybody want to unmute and shout? Any? Beaver? No, 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 sadly. I, 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 this is in Warwickshire. I know that question was asked, wasn't it? Um, um, about beaver reintroduction. And I didn't know, but Debbie, you said that happened in Cheshire, and I didn't know that even, uh, that they reintroduced in Cheshire. And, you know, the likes of the, the, the likelihood of it happening in, in Warwickshire. But no, as you can just see now, this little face poking out. This was in Warwickshire, Marston Junctions. It's all local to you. Get down there. Really, really do get down there and have a look. Thomas guest on chat, water vols. Moments. Ah, well done. Brilliant. Brilliant. Injured. Vols. Uh, and, look, and what wonderful shots. This is the trail cam. This is that bushnell trail cam. Please, of course, if there's any chance of supporting anybody, any NGO or conservation body near you that's looking after its voles, I believe mainly it will be the Wildlife Trusts. Please do show them your support and help get the water vol population back up. Oh, it was, it was kind of a campaigning level. film anyway that vlog um, about, about water vols. Uh, but a simple little construct there, simple little lure device. Um, yes, I did have to secrete my trail camera away for about three days, hoping that nobody would see it. Um, but I, I walked across um, to the little um, weir they've got there and it was a good place to hide it behind the brick wall of the weir. Um, and a good place to, 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 to balance this natural piece of wood. There, there's two apples there, so they've already consumed one apple. So they weren't, it wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't shy about taking the apples. Um, and, and Debbie, I might have some footage of your interest in actually, because I've got some lovely interaction, even during the night time, between water bowls fighting over, over these apples. And, and a rat, a brown rat came in as well. So uh, we saw the original ratty, and then we saw <laughs> the water rat. So that was, that was great. Uh, so moving on from that particular layer, um, this is something definitely you'll be able to This was um, in a, um, a, a 15th century cottage in Wales, Broadlands of Wales. Beautiful dry stone wall, perfect little table there, asking for it. A bit of seed distribution. And we should turn up. This is my action camera, right? Little, little wooden house. I hope you'll be able to confirm this, Debbie, but I believe what's about to happen now is baby back mold. Because their mum was around and she was a half a little sight bigger. But this is the teaching. This little vault is about to appear just now. There we are. Did you see oh. that? Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you see, the wood mouse doesn't like it, it gets aggressive. So if I come in and pause it. Um, yeah, it does look like a, a young bank vole, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. The longer sequence is here. Mum comes and she's about a third bigger. Um, but other than that, they look pretty identical, so I'm guessing that was a youngster, a cheeky youngster. I just love the reaction. Great little story, Lux. We know they, the wood masses tend to be nocturnal, don't they? Um, am I right in saying that? So yeah, yeah, they're off out, or, or, yeah, they're off out at night. Yeah. But not having that bang roll, obviously. Nice little secret. Um, story. I've sighted the trail Next one is in Scotland. This is on the edge of Abernethy Forest. Um, now, from from common sense and, and from thinking like a naturalist, I was in the lodge next to the edge of Abernethy Forest. I was trying to film on a trail, as you can see there, um, a mammal um, that wouldn't be high enough to come above the Bladebridge Club. So I assumed that if, if this mammal, which I knew would, is a, it's a, an arboreal mammal, I assumed that it would be using these dead trees, these lateral trees, as, as runways. Um, so I thought it'd be a great spot then to put the trail cam in that root base looking down the big tree. That was purely just common sense and, and being um, a little bit, you know, um, savvy about nature that got me to this point. 
Oh, by the way, another little thing, tracks and signs. <laughs> tracks and signs again. The, the uh, carrion crow feathers here on this tree stump. Uh, lots of carrion crow feathers and lots and lots and lots. Overgrown with moss. This is a, a, a goshawk bucking post. Um, there was just countless um, carrion crow feathers. Mass, I mean, the only bird that could take carrion crows and does often take carrion crows. And there's, there's three pairs of goshawks that have been happy. So this was actually a goshawk plucking post. An historic one because a lot of the grasses and mosses and lichens had, had sort of grown over the feathers. Um, but yeah, that was, that was also a good find. Slightly baited it with peanuts, and then, well, it's just a waiting game. Three days in, and the planets aligned. A wonderful big male pine. He was huge. Arrived. I've been warned about him. Now, they, from where my lodge was, they said that this, this male was massive, was, you know, easily the size of a tabby cat. Uh, and he was, his, his, the barrel tail was just... He enjoyed the peanuts and he seemed curious about my lodge. He was sniffing, yeah, the, sniffing the trail cam there. It was, it was the new thing in, in the territory. Of course, not knowing this, I was sighted at the lodge behind my GH5 as I had been for the previous two days, waiting to see if anything came. So my lodge is only about 300 yards to the right. Look at you the timestamps on the trail cam. <laughs> and he's yeah, only exactly a good look in that direction. Looking at the timestamp, this was 10 minutes, just 10 minutes before this happened, his next scene. I set up my GH5 through the patio window. It was an incredible moment. This Pine Martin was literally and only 10 yards from me. And it felt like arrived. I held my breath. This is the, the third day. Way. So there have been three lying on the rug, the area, <laughs> staring through the crack in the curtains. LED banks. Um, and I've been using these for the previous days, gently raising the... But I was using um, these lights here, relatively cheap. Um, you can get these for about um, 20 pounds, I think, 20, 25 pounds. They put out an enormous amount of light. You can get the nice yeah, warm... He seemed pretty comfortable he's, he's, as he tucked into the jam. Stitch them on. Incredible. Uh, so these, this is what I was using. To Obviously, light, a vital light tool for this arboreal predator who can scale trees very quickly indeed. On a lighter note, I thought it was lovely that his muzzle seemed to be creasing as he tore into the strawberry jam. And it did remind me of Paddington and marmalade sandwiches. I'm a sucker, I'm a second for Pine Martin. So that, that came through. Now, I didn't know that was going to happen. I knew this was a great spot for them. Um, anybody who wants the address, by the way, of, of those lodges, um, it's a virtual guarantee. That particular decking there had red squirrels coming to it, had Pine Martin coming to it, and Crested Tick coming to the peanut thicket. Um, you know, it's just an amazing. <laughs> you, you, didn't have, you didn't have to leave the lounge to see the three main species, <laughs> as lazy as it is. But um, I, I went there with the idea of I was going to sit out something a log or something and um, and uh, and bait it to see just to see if they would if they would come and sure enough um he, he, he came and he was huge he, he really was worth it so that's comes to a proximity there where you could get that um you get some wonderful footage just with your smartphone again we're using lures uh, moving quickly on as soon as these lures are finished by the way we'll go for the break um is that right debbie yeah done lots with lures showing lots of you uh, with lures. This isn't a food lure, this is an audible lure. Um, and again, something you can you can do, um, you know, working on kind of an ethical code of, of, of audible audible lures. Uh, but I explained that during this film. This is known as the kissing fox lure. And this was the response of a vixen um, in Pembrokeshire about three, three years ago, three, four years ago. What I like is to see the vixen appear behind that gorse. Well, the rabbit sees the fox. There we are, the rabbit's up, sees the fox. And then the rabbit immediately comes to the high ground. Um, a lot of people think this is a rabbit's mad. But this is clearly the most sensible thing for this rabbit to do because that fox will be stealthily hunting and hoping for a stealthy approach. Now that rabbit is showing itself the fox and telling the fox, I can see you. 
uh, to, you know, I'm I'm off the moon. Um, a lot of people I share this film to think that a rabbit is mad, offering himself up. You know, he's doing the right thing, absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, I knew that she had, just by the time of the year, she must have, I've got cubs that are just, just above ground and, and, and clearly hungry as well. She was hunting through the middle of the day, as it was. I'd seen her often catching uh, rabbits in this field and voles. I decided just this once to see if I could use this kissing gun. We could all do it, you purse your lips together and just make a kissing noise. And that pretty much replicates a rabbit in distress or a rodent. She immediately hears it. And she pelts, you know, she really, really reacts to it. So now she's down to half the distance she was. She was about 200 yards away. She's down to about 100 yards now. I'll do it once more. Not gonna do it anymore. I'm gonna leave it now just to her using her senses. I'm sure Debbie will back me up on this, but um, foxes in daylight, they've got pretty poor eyesight. Um, her eyes are kind of built around sort of nighttime, nighttime vision. Um, I think I think it's 20 meters, if I'm right, Debbie, um, up to about 20 meters for daylight sights. To do with the cones and the rods, isn't it? I know it's that much about it. Um, she's still not sure. Now, I'm not camouflaged, I'm stood my camera on a tripod you still can't clearly see me um, and i'm guessing it's going to be a scent and sure enough it was it was uh, a gust of wind i felt behind me um traveled to her and she instantly knew that i, I wasn't a rabbit in distress and she was off now i i this is the place i was staying this is the actual farm i was staying for the week and i can tell you she was hunting very well in the vicinity so it's not something you should use too often obviously uh, as i say here never ever use alert technique uh, then you'll be rewarded with privileged close encounters with truly wild nature um, and i certainly want to wouldn't want her uh, to put off the, the main job of, of feeding her cubs but um, should you be in a position and, and, and actually a similar noise i mean pretty much identical can bring in the likes of owls as well i've done it with a barn owl um again i think probably on the same premise that it sounds like a small rodent in distress or a rabbit in distress um and um, um i've had a barn owl come come right towards me and then see me and uh, do that kind of hiss and then turn bank away um so yeah not all there's obviously a, a food layers um but uh, one more lure and that's actually i don't know if many of you know that these exist it's a pheromone lure uh, and this was fascinating. So this was something that I used for a film uh, this year. Um, and this was July, I believe. Um, but there's a site you can buy from. This was a pheromone lure for a hornet moth. Um, anybody, anybody heard about hornet moths? Do they know about hornet moths? So this is actually a real moth, but it has clear wings and has a body, a black and yellow body, just like a hornet. What's the... Um, Debbie, what's the uh, what's the term? What's the scientific term for that? Of making yourself look look like something harmful. Um, what for the are clear wings, the moth. Yes, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, what's what's the scientific? There's a scientific term, isn't there, for something that makes itself look more harmful than it is, um, as, as a kind of camouflage. Uh, I can't think of it either. <laughs> okay. It'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. <laughs> Basically, yeah, this. Is, is it mimicry? It's mimicry for sure, yeah, but there's um, ba Batesian, Batesian, Batesian mimicry, that's the one, yeah. So there's a little special effect idea, here's a part of the storytelling, because there's no, there was no narrative on this, uh, this was all just images, so to show the pheromone, I overlaid, you'll see it again now, I overlaid this little um, file uh, with a little bit of a, a smoky steam effect, now it doesn't do that, in real life <laughs> and it might look a bit twee but it got the message across that the pheromone was being missed and within five minutes i couldn't believe it we got this uh body okay. my first my first clear wing i you know since a child wouldn't have got this with my brother um truly truly amazed work one of my more popular films this one i mean this um 
just the sheer tenacity of this buff to look so much like a warning. And to have clear wings, you know, completely transparent. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, oh, no, I will uh, mention that if any of you want to, please do actually go to my YouTube channel and subscribe, I need subscribers. Uh, if any of you want to watch the full versions of these things, uh, they're all there on my YouTube channel. Uh, but that now is the end of my lure section. Um, I was wondering where you got the, um, the hornet moth lure from. So it's um, Anglian, um, bear with me, bear with me. I'll just share my screen. So. Yeah, I was surprised how quickly it came to the law. I didn't think it would be that. Did you have yeah, to like pick like <coughs> the habitat quite quite yeah, quickly? Yeah, yeah, and, and they and they send out the literature. They send out the literature for you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so they send out the literature for you uh, with the with the lures. Um, I kind of knew um, from a friend of mine that um, they might be around. Um, okay. um, and I know that they, they liked Willow. That was Stanford Reservoir. You know Stanford Reservoir? I don't know. I don't think I've been. Uh, this is on the yeah, Leicestershire North Hans border. Oh, okay. Well, Obviously, the season is quite. Um, tight. Hmm. And seas, yeah. So it's this site. There we are. Lepidopterist supplies. Um, and down here are all the lures in this section here. Um, okay. So you can buy a, a whole whack of them, you know, a mm. collection. Um, they come in two sorts. They come in, in these little plugs. Um, yeah. or they, come in, they come in the vials like, like you saw that, uh, that I had. Don't get a pheromone trap because um, they're notorious for taking off the scales on their thoraxes. Um, oh, wow, really? That's nasty little thing. I don't know why the, the guys in this, in this site are still saying them because I was going to buy one, <coughs> but I was warned off straight away. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, uh, an, you know, a piece of um, tight or, or like I, I did, a, a bit of mesh um, and, and it's good enough. It's good enough. So you want to yeah. keep them away from the actual actual law? Uh, well, is that the idea? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, they, they can they 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 can mount the lure. Um, they realise within about ten minutes. It's not okay. Um, they'll just they'll just fly away. So, um, so yeah, there we are. I'm gonna try and get the uh, where is it now? Show the video. There we are. I can see everybody now. Oh, hi. People are back. <laughs> um, where the, uh, hi, where the, where the hornet moth lure comes from? It's these guys, and the lepidopterist supplies. I will send all the links for the the kits and uh, and places like this. Everything you've seen to Debbie. Uh, so when she has that, gives that URL, uh, unlisted URL, she'll be yeah. able to. Uh, Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. Give you these links as well, um, and obviously another 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 lure that I can use definitely. In a very effective way with something like a smartphone. Um, you can make a film uh, of some really truly amazing insects. You know? uh, some of these clear wings are, are, are absolutely stunning. And the Midlands are a good a good area for them. A good area for them. If you if you want to make sure that you're buying a lure or a moth that can be accessed in the uh, when you click on these lures, it does tell you, it shows you a map of Britain, it shows you where um, the moths, this particular moth predominates. So you can be sure that you know you're not buying something that um, you're not going to get first records. Although this was a first record for Leicestershire, so I was really happy with that. <laughs> so, uh, okay, okay, are we all in? Or are we going to hold on for another minute or so? We can get started, I think. Go for it. Okay, okay, okay. Let's have a play that again. Okay, so yes, storytelling and uh, composition again. Going to go straight into. I'm sure I've. Um, I'm sure I've uh, put the volume on. Um, be able to tell me if not. Uh, so this is a narrated piece and this is a vlog I've put out uh, but exactly on this on on the basics of composition and storytelling uh, because the two are inherently linked. So away we go.
Hi guys, welcome to vlog 40 and the first part of my wildlife filmmaking techniques which I'm calling subject shot variety and micro storylines. Bit of a mouthful, uh, but I've had to really uh, reverse engineer pretty much everything I've learned in wildlife filmmaking over the last seven years to come up with five categories uh, which I know personally uh, caused me a fair bit of grief uh, during my, uh, and I'm certainly not off the learning curve, believe you me, but during my time making wildlife films. Uh, this first one, really, in a nutshell, is just mixing up your shots. Uh, but actually, one of the most difficult to overcome because if you've come from a history like me uh, of being a photographer, then one shot was good enough, the, the, the best shot you could get. But as a filmmaker, it's very different, especially dealing with wildlife. Uh, you have to create, you're supposed to create, and rightly so, compose a storyline, uh, even if it's a very small one. So a variety of shots, absolutely uh, the bedrock of filmmaking. So let's just suggest now that we've come across a subject, whether it could be bird or beast, uh, it might be something you've been waiting passively for, for hours, uh, it might be something that just turns up in front of you. Uh, but forgive me, I thought best to deal with this with a little doodle. I'm going to make our subject a bird on a branch, no more than that. Uh, when I do this, of course, I'm conscious about getting the, the first composition uh, right in my frame. I'm using the rule of thirds. Uh, you all know this, I'm sure. Uh, putting my subject into an area where it looks into the empty space of the frame, or at least has an area to travel into. But immediately, a stopwatch has started in my head, and I give myself a very short amount of time for this shot. Uh, I give myself 15 seconds maximum. Uh, why on earth? Well, I'll come to that in a second. One thing to do remember though is I do film in 4K at 30 frames a second and that's because more often than not then I can reduce in post uh, the speed uh, to 80% uh, which gives me then 24 frames a second which is a cinematic standard but affords me an extra 3 seconds for a 15 second shot so I'm up to 18 seconds already. And I'll do this because immediately I know I need to create a sequence for a storyline and I want to put this bird in its environment, in its habitat. There's nothing better to the viewer's eyes than having a subject and then seeing where it is, properly seeing where it is in its environment. So the second shot, the key shot, is the bird in situ, wherever it may exist. Now, normally I would give for this particular shot the same amount of time as I would give for my primary shot. So around about 15 seconds, it can be 10 seconds, uh, but certainly no more than the 15 seconds. I'm then thinking of shots three and four possibly, if the subject allows. But the key thing is I now have two sequences and these are two sequences I can edit from and create a storyline. Now the primary shot may not be my first shot in the edit. I may choose my wide angle shot as my first shot and then go to my primary shot as the second part of the sequence and come back for a final stab at the wide angle shot and having a three capture sequence in my edit. Um, you might also actually, it's a good idea, uh, sometimes for your wide angle shot to be your final shot because there's a much better frame here for your subject to leave um, with a bird obviously flying out of frame uh, or with a mammal walking out of frame but that certainly does afford a, a wonderful visual completion for the viewer so just quickly you know, don't worry about the technical uh, too much um, but the speed is of the essence really um, you're dealing with wildlife um, comes and it goes um, if, if a bird is in, I mean, the money shot, I guess, is the primary shot, which is why I made the close up. The closest you, the closest you can get of your subject is probably going to be your first shot. Um, but don't, I mean, a lot of people then would stick on that because it's great. Look at it. And we're so close and it's wonderful. But if you're going to create a, a micro storyline here, uh, the viewer, the audience really want to see the environment this is in. It's, it's, it, you know, it lifts the subject. And when I say storylines, I am talking about micro storylines here, you know. Um, a bird in its environment is, is pretty much a new storyline. Just the one shot of its own is, is, is no storyline at all. It's just it's just the subject. Um, so it's it's all about mixing the shots. The bigger the variety of the shots, the better. It really is for the audience. It's much more satisfying. It tells them more. Uh, 
using that as a very basic idea of what we mean by mixing up the shots and creating micro storylines. Let me take you to Dollar Brown, the 15th century cottage in Wales I went to last May because here on arrival I was delighted to find a nest box being used by no other than a pair of pied flycatchers, a wonderful bird. So shot number one, primary shot, right there in front of me, it was a given wasn't it? Um, a perfect scenario of a bird coming to a very definite spot certainly going to be my primary shot uh, so I certainly took enough of them I can tell you now but then a few hours later I did notice my male pie flycatcher out on the surrounding pasture collecting invertebrates for the meadow itself got a fairly wide angle shot of that and it flying back to a barbed wire fence which it, it persistently used in fact it tends to use it at a meter and a half length of this fence which I then got into shots and into composition and managed to pull off an entry to the barbed wire uh, down to meadow and an exit all in the one shot so there was very definitely my shot three so now a storyline was building in my head here I could have uh, my male pipe fly catcher collecting invertebrates from the meadow and then taking its journey back to the box but I really then wanted another shot I wanted a shot of the bird on the way to the box through this copse this copse attached to the cottage that meant then the next day I searched out some of the viable perching spots in fact some of the spots I'd seen these birds these pair of birds perched on and set up the camera created a composition to the best of my ability to where I thought the birds might be and left the camera running I ended up with files and files and files of this basically empty branches uh, but it is worth it because if you get it right and if you're lucky and if you persist you're bound to be lucky then you'll end up with a shot of the subject entering the frame which is absolutely gold dust to any filmmaker it's a wonderful thing to see a very visceral thing for a viewer to see your subject coming into frame and then leaving frame uh, it's like you've second guessed the situation of course you haven't you've just persisted and persisted until eventually just like this you get some success now this was the female pie fly catcher i managed to pull off the second perspective here as well in the one shot which i was really pleased with that was a bit of quick quick moving um, and again the female a little bit too high in the frame on this one i thought she would perch lower you can see she's a little bit out of focus there uh, but eventually patience paid off and i got this shot the very briefest shot of the male passing through perfectly in the middle of the frame there that was my shot for so the sequence went like this this is the edited sequence so initially shot three uh, from the barbed wire to the meadow which of course was my shot two so shot three to shot two this is the way the edit was going and then back for the second part of my shot three back to the barbed wire you can see the way this is headed and then the bird then obviously heading out into the copse towards the box and there was my shot four that you just saw passing through and ending up in my my first shot uh, when I arrived at the cottage but now the end of my edit and the end of the sequence a lovely fluid transition from meadow to box carrying its invertebrates back to its chicks would I change any of that in hindsight yes I would and I'll tell you why I would mirror the box shot now the box as you can see is over on the left and the bird arrives to the right why on earth would I do that well let me show you let's go back to the original edit from last year up for the meadow right to left onto barbed wire for the barbed wire to copse right to left to the branch but then suddenly my last piece of the edit left to right initially originally now of course right to left also so i'm getting right to left right to left right to left through my last sequences a much more fluid encounter with this bird much more pleasing to the viewer and there we go you see there's always something to learn and always something we can change uh, with these sequences and that's the wonder that's the joy that i get from filmmaking so as a rundown i would always shoot the closest full subject as a priority no longer than 15 seconds to then cut away and show my subject in its habitat and then of course if the subject allows increase further shot variety show it with some behavior and also always consider your final edit and the micro story you want to create that one is crucial of all of them the bottom one um, and this is something you'll develop uh, once you start putting your shots together once you start um, I mean, we can play with it one of the best things ever said to me 
was uh, people don't know what you don't show them. You know, and I think that when people enter this world of filmmaking, they think, I've got to make something and everybody's going to see it. Well, no, no, not at all. You're making it for you, you know. Um, so go out and really enjoy this, really play with it. But one thing you will learn, one thing that will grow on you is whilst you're taking the shots, you'll be looking at them um, as, as a point of, of, story, of storytelling. Uh, this just develops because once you start editing, you know that story is crucial. Um, um, you, can you see the reason there for the multiple shots? Um, and the way that's created a storyline, a chapter and verse is it really, but it is a micro micro storyline. We now know this male is affecting seeds, affecting the vertebrates from the meadow, and it's taking his way from the crops back, back to the box. So uh, what appears to be one swipe there over three or four days, shots over three or four days. Uh, not, not three or four days spent, just three or four days over three or four days, you know, uh, maybe an hour or two uh, in each location. Uh, just persistently waiting and just noticing the pattern, being passive again, noticing the patterns, um, and then that makes things, I think, makes things easier. And that uh, obviously um, becomes a very viable sequence um, to put in the film. Um, say you were involved with the conservation of, of, of five fly catchers um, in the Welsh Borderlands, in the Cessar Oak Woods, uh, there you've got a wonderful sequence. You really, really have. Um, just, just from thinking about it, you know, not with too much effort. Well, that's it guys for vlog 40 i hope you enjoyed so this is all about storytelling again um, this is back to allotment fox this was a, a vixen called frankie first of all quite, she... quite an old vixen i knew that the people that owned this allotment um, molly and the graham uh, were feeding um, frankie never really feeding her whilst they were there they're always leaving a treat so they would do their work whatever their work was turning over the soil um, and then they would lock up and the keys in the door and locking up their unit here and walking away was the key for Frankie to move in. She recognised these signs. Um, she um, skewed a bit of history about her. She'd been missing for about two weeks, uh, which I, I cover in the film. Again, another wonderful part of the, of the storyline. I interviewed two or three people on the allotments that are nearly in tears because she's not around. You know, so we, we, all, we already have, we're already invested in this fox because she means so much to these people and she really did one guy mark I, I tell you to watch the film marcus he broke my heart poor man now it's the first time ever she disappeared like this and he, he fed her every day she's just returned though so there was a great you know um a period of rejoicement she's an old fox she's seven years old you know for an urban fox and she's had her four litters um but yeah <laughs> evil people molly and graham they decided they would treat her but they're going to test her so they put up some stake up this tree this fruit tree but they put it up the fruit tree because before she could jump up there you know when she was younger and i thought all the time oh, bloody hell, I'm glad she just can't just put it on the floor for her she deserves it you know she's been away convalescing or whatever uh, but here we have the sequence so i allude to the audience that the the, the stake is around and up the tree can she get the stake there now i will tell you now this initial shot was my trail cap so you know no no no, no great shakes here i wasn't here for this sequence I set up all the cameras and walked away. I was probably at home watching Match of the Day right now. I don't know. Um, but this was just a setup I'd left in place. So trail cam right now. The other camera I use in here is an action cam. And I've set that up in the tree by the stake. Now, I, I didn't, you know, in my in my naivety back then, I made a mistake. I, I, I didn't have the, the stake in the image. But it was close enough. But anyway. He needs to catch the scent. So she can smell it there, as you can see, she's a good whiff. I also imagine it's a bit like Bisto, Bisto gravy granules, you know? She can there. Uh, that's steak cap. A fox's sense of smell is infinitesimally better than ours, and it isn't long before Frankie catches a good whiff of the steak above her. The question remains though, can she retrieve it? It appears that Frankie is back to full fettle. Yeah, so another key element there, um, and this is crucial with, with storytelling, and, and an audience, whether they know it consciously or subconsciously, will recognise if you are a microsecond out with this cut, you've got to be absolutely spot on with the moment she jumps and when you cut to the new camera, it's got to marry um, 
even if people don't consciously recognize that it's out of sequence, it'll feel awkward. Visually, it feels awkward. Uh, it feels like you're jumping, you know? Retrieve it. But that's quite good fun to do. So just getting it right and then it flows. It appears that Frankie is back to full fettle. So moving on with this, this is again still a part of Allotment Fox, but it's still very sort of visceral storytelling. Um, I knew that Pete was getting rats in his shed. <laughs> um, and I wanted to film them. I quite like rats, a bit like you, Debbie. I don't mind a rat. Um, wonderful things, super intelligent. Um, so here we are encroaching Pete's shed, a bit of a rundown, ramshackle affair, coming through the knot hole. Uh, that was the idea initially. Um, I'll probably do it a bit, bit better now. This is going back, <laughs> but it works. Coming through the knot hole, and there we see the shelf with the rubber glove, and we can see the seed there. But now we're going to be transported into. Whilst topping up bird feeders, Pete has spilt some. Love seeds. the spider there. You can see the spider. I couldn't. These wonderful little, um, you know, coincidences. Um, I had a long, I had a long amount of shots with nothing in scene. I've used the shot that's got the. Whilst topping up bird feeders, obviously I'm Pete using that bit. Obviously I'm going to have to use that bit. Um, too much of a temptation for one of the smaller inhabitants of these allotments. So, this was uh, the basis of it being lit up. That I think the week before or two weeks before, there was a supermoon. Right, supermoon. I tell the audience this is a called so it's shining through the paint of glass onto that seed. Um, the cops next to the allotments does have a tawny owl. It wasn't calling that night. But there's the level of authenticity. There's, there is an owl there. Sure, on the same line. Also, I had a lot, of, a lot of shots of the moon. I picked the shot with the plane passing in front of it. Obviously, I'm going to do that. You know, it's about finding these shots, making the best you, you can. And then, of course, we get uh, a small whiskered face appears. The little guy himself. A rat. The rats on the allotment site appear to have a much healthier diet than those we would assume in the more built up areas. This allotment is actually an ancient orchard. So a lot of these rats, they just live off the, the, the windfall, you know, so much fruit around. Here they get by with predominantly fruit and seed. But again, something you can do with the, with the cameras you've got. Because I use my action camera here, literally sitting on the shelf. The light was, do you know those um, plasticky, cheap plasticky bedside lights you can get where you can put batteries in that click, you know? Gaffer tape to the side of the shed wall. Um, put new batteries in, uh, Duracell, so they last, last a longer time. Again, hooked up my action cam to the long life cell. So we've got four hours of footage, large SD card to absorb all that footage and just let it go. And, and I did this for three nights and I set it off at about 7 p.m. And I came back at one in the morning for three nights in the trot. Um, and and uh, two of those nights I got the rats coming and this was the best, best sequence from it. Um, you know, all very affordable. But, you know, I, a really lovely story, you know. Not necessarily everyone's favourite subject, but <laughs> subject matter. Just about the same time, Person. a more familiar mammal enters plot 23. No, I don't know. One for you. And with the fruit <laughs> falling in late August. And miss this one. This was a lucky escape. I would very early morning. I would have hurt seconds away from having an apple. Um, so, Coming to uh, uh, another kind of key area now of, um, of composition, but um, so you get the idea here about storytelling, about mixing up the shots, as many different angles as you can. Um, if you can imagine that everything you're filming, you want to imagine there's a little huddle of people around it, and uh, some are big, some are small, some are looking this way, some are looking that way. As many shots as you can do, and in as, in as inventive way as you can, will pull this story through. And the more you get more professional it's going to look uh, and also to remember that you're, you're cutting your transitions where you're cutting has to marry up with the previous shot if you have a bird looking to the left 
and then you cut away to the long shot and the bird is looking to the right, that's going to be awkward. It's, it's going to feel wrong, even if the audience don't consciously see it, it's going to look odd. If you cut then for a bird looking to the left, to the long shot, the bird also then has to be looking to the left. You know, because you want, you want the audience to think you're just moving from one to the other in an instant. And of course, in reality, there's probably five or ten seconds where you've pulled back, you've got it into focus and composition and, and, and pressed record. I actually, when I'm recording, um, say a primary shot and I've got the subject in frame and it's moving around, say, say if my primary shot, it starts preening. I think, oh, right, wow. Should I pull back now? Should I pull back now? Because it'd be lovely to do a long shot and still have it preening. Um, if it stops preening and I pull back, I'm hoping it starts preening again. Because to do a cut in an, in a, an active moment is again even more powerful. Uh, if there's a, a moving part of the bird and then you do the cut there from close to far, it's it's really really powerful. And birds and animals tend to do tend to repeat themselves, you know. Um, so you can. It's not the truth, obviously, but this is all smoke and mirrors. Um, but it, you know, it, it, it looks wonderful. It's very valuable to the audience. Yeah, gaps in the slats to get this, this low angle. Biggest and best uh, tip I can give you initially is to get as low as possible with wildlife, get as intimate as possible. Uh, this is New Yorker. This is a hoopoe, one of my favorite birds, one of my commoner birds. I don't go for glam. <laughs> I, don't, you know, I was just happy with this guy. Um, I spent a day on the farm here and, um, and the farmer helpfully told me that he always has a hoopoe on his red clay in the morning. I came at dawn, I got on my belly. I stuck my camera through the slats in the fence. Um, um, fantastic to see, so close up. So You're down with like, your subjects. Using that amazing beak, uh, not just for probing. You try and get away from red, that stereotypical soil, soil, but also as a uh, stabbing. Well, uh, it looks tool. dominating, it's how we look at one. And, I've seen uh, looking down at one. Stuck get with down it whilst it tried to work this, what I believe will be a beetle larva, a fairly good sized one. So certainly a decent portion of protein there. Uh, but didn't want to stop existing, this one. So uh, uh, the beak was coming to full effect. So that was Mallorca two years ago. This is only about um, about two months ago. Um, this is a place just in Cambridgeshire. Um, these are linnets. I didn't come for the linnets though. <laughs> well, by this point, I was already on my belly. Actually, I just had my blue cushion, I was on my hip. Um, and this was the star of the show. Um, simply glorious uh, turtle doves and uh, an eight come to this one spot, eight, mains the eight, you know. Again, as you can see from the angle, I'm right down with them, you're in their world, the audience is, is with them in their world. Please do try and get away from the domineering 45 degree stereotypical shots we do of our life. Again, you might look silly, <laughs> but uh, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be getting images that people would die for. Um, light, speeding along here now, which is good. Uh, light, yeah. So what, what do I need to tell you about light? Um, most wildlife documentaries that you'll watch has a horizontal light. There are, there are three forms of light, aren't there? There are the there's the overcast day, which is a good light, actually. People think, oh, no, it's overcast, it needs to be sunny. That's a good light. It's like a light box light. It's an evenly spread light. That's a lovely light for filming in. A lot of people I know prefer that to anything else. A lot of wildlife filmmakers I know prefer low light, horizontal light. So the, the light hits your subject um, from the side as opposed to above. Um, right now, which is why it was good to set you this task right now, uh, you've pretty much got wonderful light all day long. During the seven hours of daylight we've got, it's a very low light. So it's hitting most things from the side most of the day. Come May or June, of course, you've probably got a three hour spot there and you've got to start about half past four in the morning, um, which, you know, and, and then also um, the same during during the evening. Um, I think, Debbie, you said about bat ecologists uh, being tired in, in summer. Um, so it's wildlife filmmakers, I can tell Okay, setting an alarm so early. Um, so we all know that, uh, nothing really to teach you there, but I will say to you, break the rules. Because the, the biggest one, oh, don't shoot into the light. No, 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 never shoot into the light. Rubbish. Do as much as you can with light, play with light. 
uh, for Bocca for effects like this, this lovely caramel glow through the back of these cormorant wings. Uh, just really, really play with light. Do be aware though, if you want the light coming from behind you and onto your subject, do be aware that before you set off and make plans to go somewhere, you are aware of where the sun is coming up. Because a lot of people forget, oh, I'm going from A to B, to suddenly realise that their A to B means the sun is in front of them. And so they're all, unless you're walking backwards, you know, how are you going to do that? Oh, by the way, always think on your feet. This particular scene here was Brandon Reach, lovely misty morning. Um, I've got a bad habit, I vape. That's my vape. That's not missed. Um, in the absence of dry ice machines, <laughs> um, I wanted to add, this is all smoke and mirrors, but I wanted a misty effect in this light, so this shallow light coming, coming through. Um, so I added this kind of misty effect just by, uh, just by using my vape. Didn't intend to, uh, but it made the, the scene much more mystical. Um, I love misty mornings um, because of the way it refracts the light. This was Florida, that's a white-tailed deer. Um, again, shooting into the light, beautiful silhouettes, this lovely caramel haze. Do go out in inclement weather. Don't look at inclement weather as something that stops you um, because certainly now when we get brightness and shade, um, the in-between period is glorious. Um, but personally, I don't think it's anything better than a sunlit landscape you see this often in winter, a sunlit landscape with the storm clouds behind. Um, it's why I paint my walls grey, because when I put pictures on them, everything pings. Um, you know, you know, there's nothing more viscerally beautiful than a multicoloured um, skyline um, or, 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 or horizon with this beautiful dark grey behind it. It just sets everything up, everything lights up. Um, so do go out in inclement weather. Uh, the old cobweb uh, with a new angle on it. Um, the, the dew on a cobweb is a favourite, um, and that's the uh, North American wasp spider. Uh, doesn't doesn't bite. That's what I can't say about. All of these, by the way, FZ82. Apart from this one, this one's the drone again. A misty morning. This was last year. This was icy mist. You can see it sparkling as we go up. It keeps on sparkling on the lens uh, from a really kind of silhouetted skeletal tree, very grey, to an almost heavenly image there. Uh, with the goals, the roosting goals just coming away from the roost. Um, uh, and talking about biblical looks, always do, you know, take advantage. Again, you don't go out in inclement weather, you don't get these kinds of, these kinds of images, beautiful images. Um, again, backlit. Um, all from the first few hours, what we call the golden hours um, of the day. B-roll. Uh, you nod and nod your head, shake your head. Are you aware of B-roll? Have you heard of the term? Nope. Okay, so it's a term that, we, you know, if you if you go, go onto YouTube and watch the creators in there, you'll hear it quite a lot. It's everything outside of your main uh, subjects. So it's the thing that tells the story. Um, I did a B-roll uh, film for my film, Graham. So I'll let you watch this. Everything you're watching here is pretty much B-roll. Often shot at a slower speed, this was 60 frames a second. My earliest memories of being into nature when I was little was watching TV programs like Zoo Quest and Look. My dad was a real countryman and he had brilliant field craft. I remember him showing me a woodcock sitting tight on eggs. I couldn't see it at first because it was so well camouflaged that he pointed it out to me. It was magical. I don't know where the interest in cameras came from, but I've always been a huge camera geek. And when eventually I did camera work and editing professionally, the pro cameras I used didn't have long enough lenses for filming wildlife. 
It wasn't until the small SD cameras came out with 30 and 40 times lenses that I felt I could do wildlife filmmaking as a hobby. The earliest films I made I put onto DVD and gave them out to friends. And then I started my YouTube channel. Lenses got longer and the cameras got better to really what is broadcast quality. I get so much pleasure from filming for the notebooks. You're out with nature. You feel a connection with the earth. I know we're pushing for time a little bit, so I'm just going to stop that there. That, now that gives you an idea um, about B-roll. Like, all of this is B-roll. It's kind of incidental stuff. Um, and, and all taken with, with my GH5. Key thing there was, do you notice how the camera is moving all the time? Even, even, even in very small movements. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderfully visible thing to see. If you, if you watch films um, in the cinema right now, the, the, the filming style across the board is with a gentle movement all the time. It's ha probably as you would see it with your head. You know, you, you know, you don't, you never rigid with your head. You see things slightly moving left, left and right, um, and, and looking at the details. You know, this really personal approach. And for me, this is the way I like to think that sort of conservation videos are going. The much more personal approach, so people can make attachments rather than just kind of starched, straight up giving facts and stuff. Um, to, to find somebody maybe that's involved with, with the campaign, um, maybe not the, one of the leaders coming, one of the volunteers who's invested so much, it means so much to them, you know, to get inside their life and to do this wonderful B-roll where, you know, where you can really feel their emotion. People buy that, people will buy into it, and people will care about it, you know, and they'll be supporting you before you know it. Um, so, um, with an absence of having that kind of opportunity at that moment, I, was, I did it on, on Graham, um, a great character. Um, now, I'm going to hit into audio uh, just just quickly, um, and um, I'm going to stay with this film uh, because it was the most ideal opportunity to show you what audio can do. This is filmed in 60 frames a second. None of what you heard there, and you heard quite a bit of audio, didn't you? matching the winds and the, uh, the rustling of, of the reeds and, and those golden plover, that huge flock of golden plover and the, the piping calls and, and the lapping of the water. Um, well, this is framed at 60 frames a second. So my camera doesn't record any audio at all. All of that is dubbed. All of that is dubbed. Um, it's authentically dubbed. Some of it I caught um, by using my uh, digital recorder here um, separately. Uh, but you'll notice how windy it was, and even this, with its, it's very bad name, a dead cat, um, even this, but with the dead cat muffler, uh, I was still getting some nasty reverb uh, from the wind. Uh, so it just really wasn't possible to use much of what I recorded on this anyway. So I went to a site called Freesound. Uh, again, that will be a link that Debbie will, will give to you. Um, but um, I mean, the, to the point, if I just play you back uh, the, these reeds, Rusty, uh, these reeds are actually in the massive. <laughs> this was a sound file sourced on Freesound from somebody recording wind in the scrub of the Masai Mara in Kenya. Um, but it matches. It's it's the noise almost exactly of what those reeds were making. Um, so again, smoke and mirrors. But th this is this is what it's about. You want to tell the story. You want to make it as effective as possible. There's a little sequence here where um, um, Graham sits in a chair and if you can, you know, 
take time to make the, the, those little noises perfect. I, I wanted a chair noise on, on a wooden surface, squeaking. You know how they do on the old school chairs on a, on a wooden on a wooden floor. We have the just that that really little nice. noise there. Uh, um, again, dubbed, but you put that in, it makes the situation real. The, the wind whistling through the hide, by the way, that wasn't me, me needing twee. Uh, <laughs> actually, I was in that hide and the wind was whistling. So there is a level of authenticity to this. Um, but, you know, um, these sites exist, such as Free Sound, and it is absolutely free, um, as long as you credit them. Um, it makes these things much more real. So that is basically B roll. And I would suggest that as a key to, that's the glue to all your uh, wonderful nature shots, you know, the subject shots, um, the, 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 the creatures or whatever it's the subject matter that you want to focus on, needs a kind of glue, uh, maybe, maybe an emotional aspect, personal aspect, um, to, to bring it all together. Then people then really, really start to care about it. For my Brandon Reach film, I included Nick. I wanted Nick to be this character walking to the, you know, this new reserve, this place he was going to be in charge of, and he was so proud of it. Uh, that was all B-roll when I followed Nick. Um, he was horrendously ripped for it, bless him. <laughs> after, after the trust got to see it, there was gladiator moments. I had his hand coming through some of the, um, some of the grass, you know, like, like on Gladiator, Russell Crowe. And I know that a few of his colleagues sent him pictures of them rubbing walls with their hands and stuff. Uh, poor old Nick. But, it, you know, it worked. And, and it, that film got a response from trust members and trustees like no other film had. Because at last we were seeing something that was personal to somebody. It meant something. And, um, and, and you invested in it. You absolutely invested in it. So, again, free sound. There'll be a link that Debbie will supply to you. Um, and it's good fun, oh, isn't it great fun just putting these things on, you know? I mean, you can mess around with them, you can be terribly, uh, uh, you know, you can put some sounds in that just shouldn't be there. But I like, obviously, I like the authentic bits. Um, so, um, thinking about transitions. Um, oh, this, this, sorry, this is another clip with audio. So this was um, a black cat. And then the second. Old Wolf Wolver turned up. Was it you, Emma, that said on a previous webinar people. something about it's much more powerful with birds song if you see the bird singing it? The visual aspect. I think it was, wasn't it? I remember, I remember that. And this is a, a black cap um, down at Brandon Reach, actually. Um, and do notice I've got the black cap coming into frame. So that's that wonderful shot again. Uh, the, the gold dust shot. Um, your subject enter into frame because he was leaving his, his neck. Then the second and one, old Lord 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 turned up. This one, the much more familiar yeah, looking to most people. Male Shine. black cap. You can hear him calling. Uh, never tired. And it matches. The male listen. black cap's song. And certainly still holding a lot of novelty value. This early on in the season. Um, amazing bird. Absolutely love him. This one actually, possibly a little bit more local than the other two migrants. So, so the other two. So a beautiful song from a beautiful black cat. That isn't that black cap singing. That's a black cap song I've put on to that black cap because again, uh, there was people behind me. There was a couple of ladies chatting. The dog was barking. Uh, <laughs> I had this wonderful shot of a black cap where, and, and singing this wonderful chorus. But there's no way I could have used the natural audio. Um, um, I went to Zeno Canto, which I know that Ed Druitt um, um, showed you, didn't he? This wonderful site we can access, we can download those bird songs as well. Um, so then it's just a case of marrying up the song with, um, um, you know, frame by frame, I'm watching this black cat just starting to open its beak and then I'm putting in a section of song until he just closes his beak. And thankfully, you know, it, it marries up well. So you can play with audio. I would suggest if you can or if you do take out a phone, um, a smartphone and use that as your predominant source of filming to, after you finish filming, to maybe leave it somewhere with you close by um, and get some ambient sound. Um, just recorded onto your phone as well, because then you can just layer that on. It'll be your saviour, believe you me. You layer that on behind your images, so you get this wonderful soundscape. Um, but outside of that, there is the likes of Free Sound, there is the likes of Xeno Canto. Um, transitions. Uh, another key aspect. I want you to tell me if you can see the transitions here, or this transition in this particular scene coming up. This was down at Holcombe Beach in Norfolk. I was there to try and find... It's actually January, a very warm January day. We 
Did you see that? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that moment she didn't think you saw that. Okay, so here we go. Push the catcher in the foreground. The people behind carrying scopes and stuff. There's a lot of people here to see these snow weddings. And if you watch, somebody passes right in front of my camera, right to left. And we're into a new scene. Now, when I when I was filming this scene that you're watching now, with the, with the guy sat up on the sand dunes, and it is a guy, um, again, somebody passed right to left in front of my camera, just like what had happened with filling up the whole frame. So if I come very slowly, it's going to be difficult, isn't it? <laughs> Slight of hand here. Um, I'm trying to get where the whole frame there. Now there's a cut there. The cut is halfway between the person who originally passed me in front of the oyster catcher and the person who passed me with the guy in the sand dune. So the, the, the swipe of the person passing brings you to a brand new scene. So just because I had a similar event appear, it's a perfect place for a transition. The person passes just now, I'm going to the sand dunes. So you can do things like that. That's probably, I mean, if you go on to YouTube, you'll see all these wonderful kinds of they call them speed ramping and um, that there is a, a, a very um, trendy way right now of if you're vlogging having the camera like this towards you um, and then when you've finished speaking to the camera if it's FaceTime push the camera say to the right and then approaching your next shot again if your next shot is also speaking to the camera set up the camera to the left and bring the camera to the right to your face now this could be you moving from a beach into a city you make that cut during that blur of that visceral movement from left to right, uh, the transition will be within that and it's very effective. Suddenly, it's the same face, same distance away from the camera, you've gone from being on the beach into the middle of, of uh, an inner city. There are clever little transitions you can do, uh, you will find more about them on, online, but a nice one to do is simply just covering the lens. Um, and the transitions is where I'm going to leave you today, but I thought well, if I can show you a film that's full of transitions, and it would be nice also because today is the big 50th anniversary day, celebration day for the Trust. If I showed you the film I made for the Trust for their 50th anniversary, because it is full, it's led by transitions. In fact, the idea of the transitions created the storyline for this film. So the next thing you're about to see, I don't know if Jake's still with us, is he? Uh, <laughs> next thing, is he still around? Yeah, still here. <laughs> oh, you still here, Jake? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, yeah, Jake has a, has, a, has a role in this, so uh, we'll enjoy Jake. But yeah, do enjoy this, um, and then I'll do a quick Q&A uh, once it's through. Oh, there's the camera. Fifty years ago, back in 1970, local people came together to establish our charity in response to a crisis. Precious sites for nature were under threat from human development, and there was an urgent need to protect wildlife for the future. This year, we celebrate our 50th anniversary and look back at some of the highlights of the last five decades and where we are today. Our Brandon Marsh Nature Centre was opened by Chloe, with a little help from Sir David Attenborough. And she's still inspired by that moment. We're still improving Brandon Marsh and in 2019 doubled our reserve size here by adding Brandon Reach. We also put up a new nesting platform. Hoping to attract ospreys to the reserve. We've always believed in managing our woodlands with techniques like thinning and coppicing providing a home for a bigger range of wildlife. Our oh, Debbie's left. It's the, it's the third scene. And coppicing continues today to help create the perfect habitat <laughs> for endangered hazel dormice in our woodlands. We 
We've always stood up for our local wild places. In 1988, our then CEO, Andy Tasker, and fellow protesters took to a valuable wildlife site in Bishop's Itchington, hoping to save it from developers. Today, it's now one of our 65 nature reserves, and we manage 1,000 hectares. In 2019, we joined 12,000 people in a mass lobby at Westminster. Hello everybody, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's come to the mass lobby here at Westminster. The time is now. Thank you ever so much for your activism, for your energy, for giving up a day of work, for coming down to London and talking to MPs to ensure that we can all have a wilder future. Thank you ever so much. Inspiring the next generation about nature has always been important to us. Here's a group of children meeting some pond creatures for the first time. Our current education team ran an environmental programme that engaged more than 23,000 local children last year. Our volunteers are crucial in helping us deliver our vital work. And they've been here since the very beginning, as our first paid staff member was only appointed in 1973. Now we have over 600 volunteers. Getting hands-on with Nature Force, Survey Force, in our offices, at our visitor centres at Brandon Marsh and Parkridge, and out at events. Thank you all. Today we stand on the verge of another crisis for our natural world. Now is the critical time to bring about nature's recovery. With your support, we can bring wildlife back. And help people reconnect with nature. I know about a screen for pause in there, guys. So yeah, um, when, when we got uh, together and, and, and thought about this idea for the end of uh, last year, um, we knew we wanted to deal with the photos. We had this huge archive of photos, and the idea was how we're going to power that through through the film. Um, and I knew of this transition, um, and I said, "Well, look, you know, I've seen this happen before. We could have photos lined up, but we always we wanted." You know, different people in different locations finding photos, and it was difficult to think how we could incorporate them. So, are they just finding them? Is, is there going to be a photo in the bramble? Is there going to be a photo floating on a pond or something? You know, how can we make this work? Um, and it all came through that, that simple but effective uh, transition there. And then the key thing at the end, obviously, is the collage uh, of photos matching the 50. Um, and Jim, bless him, Jim actually sent me an email this week to say he'd watch it and love it. So, such a great actor. Um, but the, the, the hand coming in with the photo at the end there, I actually printed um, um, an A1 size of the 50. Um, and it came up, you know, a nice amount of quality and laid it on the ground, um, asked Jim to imagine it was in front of him. So it looked like he was pushing it towards the 50. And then we had him lower it on this huge poster of the corner of the 50 where his photo was going. And then I just melted that into the graphic that I had on it. Um, which, which proves to be really, really effective, but uh, a great use of transitions. Transitions can power, can power the story as well. So I hope you've got a lot from this. It's been really enjoyable. Key elements are, I guess, it'd be passive, absolutely passive. Nothing's going to happen for you unless you stop uh, and, and get comfortable, you know. 
Um, certainly wrap up warm if you're going to do that in the next uh, in the next few days or weeks. Um, also, think of storylines when you're there. Watch the patterns, watch the routines, uh, awaken your senses, see what's around you, um, and, and and remember because remember these things happen. There are cyclical. Uh, remember and and come back to it um, and enjoy. I was just thinking in terms of editing, is there a particular software that you use to edit? Because I can take yeah. lots of videos, but actually putting it into some of well, it's kind of worth doing. I'm not really sure where to start with that. So you're thinking about PC-based software or software for your smartphone? Um, oh, I suppose smartphone, I'll just say quickly, that might be the quicker answer rather than PC-based. Okay. My, my, my PC-based um, editing software is Adobe uh, Premiere, Premiere Pro CC, um, but they do also a smartphone version. I think this is the one you used, Debbie. I think you, you mentioned this to me. It's known as Adobe, Adobe Premiere Rush. And I believe it's £10 a month. Adobe Premiere Rush. Uh, and that's £10, £10 a month. There are free versions. Uh, there is an editing suite for smartphones known as Quick. Uh, that's just with a K. Uh, Quick with a K. Um, and if you've got an iPhone, they have their own editing suites as, uh, suite as well. Uh, and that's known as Apple Clips. Apple Clips. So these are all video editing suites for smartphones. You can also use iMovie on an iPhone as well. Yeah, yeah I don't have any iPhone or Apple products. I'm yeah. all very Microsoft, okay. so <laughs> I'm not really sure. Where to start. Can you put it on your um, computer and um, just for free, like quickly, if you wanted to say do this task over the festive period and you don't want to pay any money. Um, you can use the, just the photo editor to edit videos as well, like you can do that quite simply. Um, so, you know, if you sort of right click to open the photo and then you can click um, create video or um, something like that. Some of those options, if you open it in the photo editor, it then becomes a video editor as well. Um, and yeah. so that's a really easy way to just spice things for free um, if you want to have a go at that as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'll have a go. There must be some free software on my computer somewhere anyway, so I'll have a little look um, and yeah. see. Thank you. I was just, just about to say that I'm sure if you research it, you'll find something that's got a trial period that you can use and take advantage of. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks. A pleasure. A pleasure. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't know if I'm seeing anybody. Uh, yeah, Simon. Oh, no, I joke, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was, I was just wondering, um, is there sort of like a, a sweet rule that you use for narrating over, over some video? How like how long is is too much or too ah, little? Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, but it's it's something I've always. Um, I mean, initially when I started out filmmaking, I, my my clips were too long, my narrative was too long, my uploads were too long. <laughs> my my yeah. allotment fox an hour and ten minutes. Um, when I finished my first bit, people liked it though. I've I've got it down to forty minutes now though. Uh, yeah, so sh short and sweet and concise is certainly the way forward. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and languishing on clips. I think I think I'm I'm right in saying that there's, there's been a, a psychological report about um, um, human observation, and I think which is why I stuck with 15 seconds for my clips. I think about 15 seconds is all a human needs to take what to take in what's going on, appreciate it, and then possibly want to meet you. So 15 seconds for a clip, you know, of one sort is it's it's good enough. Um, it doesn't matter if you if you come to the same subject for your second clip. Like you do, you know, a, 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 a much wider angle of clip, showing the subject in its environment. It, that counts as a new clip to the human mind. You're still, you're enjoying something new. Um, but any one clip, any one sequence, well, sorry, any one clip, probably about ten to fifteen seconds. You don't don't kind of language. But you think the brain is taking everything in by that point. Okay. Yeah. If you're looking to um, edit any audio, just while I think about it, you can use Audacity software. If anyone's used that before, that's free. Um, and you can uh, take out some of the background noise. You can play with all the volume and amplitude and all that kind of stuff. It's fairly simple to use uh, just for the audio aspect. If you want to add in anything particular, that's quite good to use. Also a crucial element, I forgot to mention it, uh, your soundtrack, your music. You can go to a site called FMA. FMA, again, this will be part of what I sent to Debbie as the links. Free Music Archive, FMA. Um, and they've got some wonderful artists and a massive catalogue. All they want is accreditation. That's all they want. Uh, and then it's free. Kai Engel uh, is somebody, K-A-I-E-N-G-E-L. Uh, this is Russian composer. He's only in his mid-20s. Mid Brilliant lad. Genius. And he does the most wonderful ethereal bits of music. But he, he covers quite a few genres. Uh, Kai Engel is, is, a, is a great one to start with. 